Hello and welcome to this episode of Glow Heartfulness Webinars. October 10th was World Mental Health Day. Mental disorders are among the most common causes of disability. The resulting disease burden of mental illness is among the highest of all diseases. The World Economic Forum in 2018 noted that the mental health disorders are on the rise in every country in the world and could cost the global economy up to 16 trillion dollars between 2010 and 2030 if a collective failure to respond is not addressed. We are faced with an international mental health crisis and have been forewarned over the past two decades of this imminent catastrophe. One in five kids and adults struggle with some type of mental diagnosis, while childhood and adult ADHD has risen over 2,000% in the last 20 years. We are seeing an epidemic rise in physical and mental health issues in the last decades, and it's only getting worse. What is happening in the brain of a child? What is happening in the brain of an adult? Today, we live in a society which impacts our brains in its development negatively in so many ways. So today, please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Budelik from France and Dr. Birgit Gyor from Germany. Both graduated as medical doctors. They've been trained by Dr. Robert Melillo from US in helping people with neurodevelopmental disorders and are now spreading his work in Europe. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Elizabeth and Dr. Birgit. A warm welcome to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. And it's good evening in India and it's good afternoon in the Europe. So wherever you are in this time of the day, welcome. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Robert Melillo. He's an American chiropractor and researcher. Through his experience and research, he developed the concept he calls functional disconnection syndrome. We'll talk a little bit about it later in the webinar. Dr. Robert Melillo has been helping thousands of children with various neurological dysfunction for so many years. This method has been the subject of an independent study done at the psychiatric department of Harvard Medical School and shown that after three months of brain balance exercises and interactive metronome, Children with ADHD have had not only beneficial effects on attention and hyperactivity, but also shown physical effects in the MRT on brain connectivity between the regions involved in the symptomology of ADHD. This study is about to be published. Let us hear from the expert. So let me begin with Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, a warm welcome to you once again. And uh, before we actually launch or start talking about the science behind it, I would like to know a little bit about yourself. I would like to know why you venture into this field of developmental disorder studies. Okay, so uh, after I finished my medical education as an occupational doctor, I had a little daughter, Charlotte. Uh, she was born a few days after term, but with a very low birth weight of 2.2 kilos. So she grew up following the lowest curve. She was delayed to sit, she never crawled nor creep. She only walked around 18 and a half months and was falling a lot. So everybody around me was saying, don't worry, every child is different, there is no problem. But a few months later, Charlotte was labeled with a developmental delay by a neuropediatrician. So at the age of two years old, she had the development of a nine months old child. So, of course, no reason was given, maybe a lack of oxygen during the last trimester of pregnancy. Nobody really had an answer for a delay. So, Charlotte went through different types of therapies, such as speech and language, physiotherapy, and many others, but never really see a, a real impact on her. And as a mother and as a medical doctor, so I was looking for methods which could help her um, and at some point, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, train as a Montessori teacher, which is a bit different, but, and uh, I thought that it could actually help her to give us the best environmental, uh, educational environment. Um, so I educated myself and I, uh, Charlotte went to different Montessori school, usually with an assistant. And uh, later on, she finally went to a special needs school. 
So she was very well taken care of, but I was still looking for um, a way to help her with her issues. So I was hoping to find someone or some method who could really address a problem uh, at the core and not just compensate for difficulties. So actually, when she was 13 years old, I met uh, someone who told me that an institute in Philadelphia in US could help her. So I got educated to work with, my, with their method with my daughter. Uh, that was actually the first method who actually was addressing the brain, working on the brain and dealing with lifetime issues and food as well. It was really an intensive program at the beginning. I was working between six and seven hours a day with her during one and a half year. Uh, and then we reduce a little bit and we work three hours a day uh, for one more year. So at the first, Charlotte was really making enormous progress in different, uh, all the domain, physical health, speech, in sensory. But after some time, things were stagnating again. So then I met someone who recommended me to read the book of Dr. Melillo, which was called Disconnected Kids. And I really encourage to read this book. It's really fantastic. And that book was really a revelation for me. Everything was so logic in a way and i was very surprised that such a method was not known uh, apart from us so uh, dr melillo has more than 100 brain balance center in us working with children with learning and behavioral issues um, and we didn't know about it here in europe so i had the opportunity to take a course with dr melillo in italy and of course, I was getting more and more enthusiastic about the concept of brain imbalance and actually how to correct it. So being also a teacher, I've been uh, teaching many years. I had I was been also in contact with more and more children needing extra help for issues which actually were not addressed, but just trying to compensate their issues. So two years ago, when I moved back to France, I decided to open my own clinic to use my knowledge and personal experience to help other children and their parents. And of course, I continue to work with my daughter, who is now Dr. Melilo's method. Thank you so much for sharing that personal journey, Dr. Elizabeth. I hope your daughter is doing much better these days. Absolutely, but there is still way to go. Yeah, okay. I wish her all the best and <laughs> thank you for joining us today. I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Birgit Dürr from Germany. So uh, we would like to know your personal journey too. Actually, it's uh, Elizabeth and I have been knowing each other since we have been medical students and we have been often talking about medicine and different kinds of approaches in medicine. And of course, I followed her and Charlotte's development over the years. And in addition, I was confronted with both milder and more severe cases of developmental deficits in my immediate environment. I think we all know families where children have either behavioral or learning issues. So after Elizabeth met Dr. Melillo, she called me and she said, Birgit, you have to read Dr. Melillo's book, which you mentioned before. And I did. And what I read, read made a lot of sense to me. And I was right away able to recognize people with brain imbalances in my surrounding and was able to actually get confirmation for, for what Dr. Melillo has written. Um, I've always been looking for a method which is simple and effective. And I also saw or still see a huge need, especially for the youth of today. And so I trained myself with Dr. Melillo and I'm using his method now in my clinic in Munich. Thank you so much for sharing that, Birgit. Okay, so could you tell us what is actually happening in the brain of a child or an adult who has difficulties to learn or control their behavior? Well, um, if I had to answer this question in one sentence, I would say that it is a brain imbalance. So, here is the definition given by Dr. Melillo in his textbook, 
neurobehavioral disorders of childhood and evolutionary perspective. All of the conditions that adversely affect behavior and learning are actually related to one problem, an imbalance of electrical activity between areas of the brain, especially between the right and left hemispheres. There's even a name for it, functional disconnection. Thank you so much, Dr. Biergit. Uh, but can you tell me what a functional disconnection is? Yeah. Essentially, it is a lack of connection, communication, and integration between the two networks on both sides of the brain. The most common brain imbalance occurs between the two hemispheres of the brain, meaning the right and the left hemisphere. This lack of integration is usually a result of a developmental imbalance or developmental asynchrony. When we say developmental, it means that something is happening during the baby's or child's developmental period, which affects the growth, or rather, the timing of the growth of the right and left hemisphere. The development is not following its intended timeline, and usually this process starts in the womb already. So when we speak of a functional disconnection syndrome, we actually not speaking about brain damage. What should be the normal schedule of brain development? So I will take over. <laughs> so normally the right brain, uh, the right hemisphere develops first intrauterine and during the first three years of life, then the left hemisphere takes over for the next period of two to three years. Of course, both hemispheres are growing at the same time but during these first three years, the right one is a little bit more active. We say about 20% more and responds so a little bit faster to the surrounding stimuli. Then between three and six years, the left hemisphere is a little bit more active. So at the end of the first six years, both hemispheres then should have developed equally in terms of maturity but differently in terms of function. At the right and left hemisphere continue to develop by alternating period of two to three years until young adulthood, that slight difference in functioning will increase. So each hemisphere will specialize more and more. Now, if something happens that interferes with the development of the brain during these six first years, one side of the brain will be delayed or slowed in its development, which often causes the other side to mature and grow faster. And that's what will cause a brain imbalance. So as the brain develops, this imbalance will become more and more pronounced with one hemisphere behind and the other one ahead. This imbalance in growth and maturity then prevents the two sides of the brain from properly integrating. This results in what we call unevenness of skill or unevenness of functional abilities where one side of the brain is advanced or even too strong relative to the other side which has skills and function that are underdeveloped and weaker. There may be sometimes several years of difference between certain functions. Of course, in some cases, both sides of the brain will be delayed, but usually you will always find one side a little bit more delayed than the other one. You have to remember, of course, that what we need for optimal functional functioning is a healthy development of both the right and left hemisphere with specialized function and these both sides need functional connectivity to be able to communicate with one another properly. Whatever we do, of course, we should be using both sides of our brain together to get optimal results. So we see that anything that prevents the brain from integrating will cause problems and that is what is at the root of almost all developmental problems 
and almost all mental health issues. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth. That was very uh, explanatory. And uh, I'm so impressed with what you have just now shared. What are the issues associated with a brain imbalance? Well, as the brain controls everything or is involved in almost all functions of the body, an imbalance in the brain can result in imbalances in every system of the body and in every combination. Each person is different and each person can have a specific combination of strengths and weaknesses. But we can find common features depending which areas of the brain and also which hemisphere is affected and in what way. Diagnoses associated with a brain imbalance are, for example, ADHD, autism, dyslexia, OCD, memory and concentration issues, depression or anxiety. But we also find muscle and sensory imbalances that can cause back pain, headaches or dizziness, or hormone imbalances that can affect, for example, blood sugar or fat metabolism. And very often we find immune imbalances that can cause allergies, food sensitivities, and autoimmune issues, or on the other hand, chronic infections. All of these issues have been increasing at epidemic levels, and all can be a direct result of a developmental brain imbalance. Thank you so much, Dr. Birgit. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Elizabeth, and I would like to ask you, what are the causes of brain imbalance? Yes. So what we know now is that the environment is playing a greater role than the genes in creating a brain imbalance. That what we call epigenetics, meaning the influence of the environment on the expression of our genes. The majority of our genes, we say about 85%, are there to build the brain. These genes are supposed to be in the on position in the womb but mainly from birth. If something prevents them to, turn, to be turned on, or if they are delayed in turning on, there will be a delay in growth and development of the brain. One key process on gene expression is called DNA methylation. When exposed to stress, toxins, or negative responses, our body produces what we call methyl molecules. These molecules can attach themselves to DNA segments and prevent their transcription and translation. They don't alter the structure of DNA, but they cover part of it so that the protein created will be different at the end. This methylation can turn a gene off at any time during life. So if some environmental exposure methylates a gene in an adult prior to conception, it can be passed on to the child and will interfere with his normal brain development. It has been shown that these epimutations can be passed on over several generations. And researchers have also shown that these genes in the off position can be turned on again with intensive training and enrichment of the environment. So, as I just said, the cause of a brain imbalance is mainly environmental and lifestyle changes that have come about over the past 20 years, primarily with the advancement in computer technology. Lack of physical activity, a poor diet, stress and inflammation are the primary factors then affect brain development and can lead to imbalances in the brain. Video games um, or many hours on, on analytic computer work can induce a brain imbalance as well. By these activities, the left side of the brain will be overactivated and if we excessively use one side of the brain, it will automatically shut down the other side. Of course, there are other risk factors as well. 
such as an undetected brain imbalance in one or both parents, which is quite common, uh, pollution, chemicals, and many others. But it is mostly our lifestyle which is at the root of a brain imbalance. The accumulation of risk factor can induce that brain imbalance. Brain, alors, physical trauma, head injury, or psychological traumas can also cause some uh, disconnection syndrome later in life, but it is not as common as the imbalance being there from beginning, the developmental of the child. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth. Thank you so much. It was very exhaustive and um, very enlightening. And uh, which leads me on to my next question. Is it possible to correct such a brain imbalance? Um, as I said before, each person has a unique combination of strengths and weaknesses. And to correct the problem, we have to identify the nature of the imbalance, meaning we find the weaker areas of the brain in our examination. And then we target them with a specific program of mental and physical exercises, sensory stimulation, lifestyle and behavior modifications, and along with a supporting healthy diet or nutrition. Adopting some simple lifestyle changes, some simple activities and exercises will start changing your brain right away. But the most or the two most important aspects in supporting the development of the brain are integrating the primitive reflexes through motor exercises and stimulating the underdeveloped hemisphere with mainly sensory stimulation if there is no damage or pathology in the brain. If it is, as we explained before, an electrical imbalance, it can be corrected. And what we see is when the imbalance in the brain is corrected, all the other imbalances are most often corrected as well. Primitive reflexes, can you tell us more about their role in the brain development? Primitive reflexes are automatic stereotypical movements essential for development in the womb and during the baby first months. They're actually part of a normal pediatrician exam. These primitive reflexes, they develop in the brainstem, here at the back, before, uh, before birth and contribute to the development of the nervous system. They will help the baby to come out the birth canal and are the foundation necessary for the baby's development. They are essential for its survival during the first three weeks of life. These reflexes allow the baby to interact with the world around him and thus contribute to the development of his brain. Most of these primitive reflexes are integrated, meaning they, we don't see them anymore, during the first year of life, at the more complex part of the brain takes control. So we can, I will just give you uh, the main primitive reflexes. We speak about fear paralysis reflex, tonic labyrinthine reflex, Asymmetric tonic neck reflex, moral reflex, spinal gallant, symmetric tonic neck reflex, the Babinski, palmer grasp, the rooting or sucking, and the snoot reflex. These reflexes, which persist beyond the first year of life, are called persistent primitive reflexes and can affect normal neurological development and therefore be the cause of a multitude of symptoms, including learning difficulties and behavior issues. There exist simple exercises that can help to integrate them. I will just give you one example because everybody, everybody knows this moral reflex. So the baby, if you make a loud noise, will open suddenly his arm and then cross them again. So uh, if this reflex persists too long, it can have an impact and give many symptoms such as impulsive behavior, hypersensitivity to light, sound, or to sudden movement, a dislike of change, difficulty with new or stimulating experiences. It can give chronic anxiety, it can give mood swings, aggressive outbursts. So this reflex can persist even in an adult 
and will give also these kind of symptoms. So it is very important uh, to look at these primitive reflexes. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the brain uh, development, but just it's important to remember that the brain develops what we say from bottom to up, meaning from the brainstem to the cortex. And then the cortex will go down and then control everything from top to down. So it is important to help the brain to develop from the bottom up first by integrating these primitive reflexes, which, like I said, are from the brainstem. Thank you so much, Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, as we discuss, I have a question coming up from Sara Babar, and she is a human development student. Her next question to you is, can you tell us a little bit more about the hemispheres? Actually, that's a very good question because to understand what is happening in the brain of a child with neurodevelopmental issues, we have to understand the different functioning or the different tasks of the two hemispheres. As it was said before, the right hemisphere is online first. It sees the big picture. It's there to actually protect us. It's cautious. The right brain is responsible for non-verbal communication, which is at the um, core of socialization. It forms relationships. It is able to read between the lines. The right hemisphere learns subconsciously, implicitly. We don't really form conscious memory the first three years of life. And that's what we call childhood amnesia. The right hemisphere is responsible for reading comprehension and mass reasoning. It is dealing also with cross motor skills. It is responsible for long-term, non-rewarded, sustained attention, like a hunter waiting for hours for his prey. It deals also with withdrawal behavior and negative emotions, such as fear, guilt, and shame. And the right hemisphere will actually decrease our immune system. When we come to the left, the left hemisphere sees details, like the individual trees in a forest. It is all about the why. For example, if you think of a child of two or three years old, looking at small animals on the ground, asking why this, why that. And it also deals with the fine motor skills. It is the logical sequential brain looking for patterns. It is responsible for reading words, spelling, and basic arithmetic. The left hemisphere forms conscious memories. It deals with approach behavior and emotions, such as anger, surprise, or happiness. It is the hemisphere which is naturally impulsive or even compulsive or obsessive. It is responsible for short-term, goal-directed, reward-reinforced attention. Video games will stimulate or even overstimulate the left side of the brain. As a picture, you can imagine an automatic car. When you remove your foot from the brake, the car goes forward by itself. Now think of the right hemisphere being the brake. If there's not enough brake or right brain, the left hemisphere will start automatically. Thank you, Dr. Virgit. Uh, I would like an example, you know, to understand it better. Like what happens with a kid who has ADHD? Yeah, so a child diagnosed ADHD is usually having an underdeveloped, underintegrated networks usually on his right hemisphere. The child will present symptoms related to a right hemisphere delay associated with symptoms related to a left hemisphere too strong. The child can be hyperactive, obsessive, compulsive. 
It can be overly focused on details, not paying attention to the big picture. He, will li he likes to do things over and over again. He can have tics, motor tics, vocal tics. His strong left brain will be responsible for anger outburst, hypersensitivity to sound, especially high frequency sounds. So you can see the child sometimes covering his ears when there is too much noise. The symptom related to a low activity of the right hemisphere will be a poor long-term sustained attention, poor nonverbal communication. So the child will have difficulties to pick up on facial emotion, social cues. The child can have poor math reasoning skill, having difficulty in comprehending what he's reading. The right brain, in that case, will not play its role of inhibition, so the heart rate can be high, the immune system can be too strong with food sensitivity, environmental allergy, for example. So an imbalance in the child will persist actually throughout his whole life, and this is why there is an epidemic rise of issues even in the adult population. A child will not grow out of his issues. He might just express it in a different way as an adult. The imbalance will still be there. So it's not actually a coincidence that one out of five children has some kind of learning or behavior issues and that one out of five adults has some kind of mental issues. Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth. Uh, my next question is progressing on this. Could you expand on the connection of a brain imbalance and the effect it has on the overall health of a person? Almost all kids with developmental imbalances not only struggle in school with learning or behavior, but are suffering from many other health issues as well. In this context, it's actually very interesting to look at the ACES studies, which is one of the largest investigations ever conducted to assess the association between childhood exposure to traumatic stressors and health and well being later on in life. The whole story started in an obesity clinic in California in the early 90s. People were there to lose weight. And what happened was that after some time of the program, 50% of the people were dropping out. And the really interesting thing was that the people dropping out were the people who were actually the ones having the best results, meaning they were losing weight. So uh, the people who conducted the study were asking themselves, why are they dropping out? And what they found when they interviewed these people that a majority of these people had experienced abuse in their childhood. And after that, they made a huge investigation on more than 17,000 patients uh, over the experience of childhood trauma. And what they found was that there were, you can say mainly about 10 adverse childhood experiences which played a major role on health later on in life. Um, just um, to mention a few, it is of course, emotional, physical and sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, uh, exposure to domestic violence, household mental illnesses, household mental illnesses and others. And what they also found was that there was, of course, a correlation between the number of ACEs a person had experienced and the chance of poor outcome later on in life. And when they followed people during their life later, they saw that they were 400 to 1,200% more likely to struggle with all different kinds of health-related illnesses such as diabetes or cancer, depression, heart disease, autoimmune issues, or even earlier deaths. So in this context, what is the relation between a child 
having undergone an adverse childhood experience and a child with neurological developmental delay. They both have a disrupted neurodevelopment because when a child is neglected or abused, it disrupts neurodevelopment. So whether a child has a delay in neurodevelopment due to an adverse childhood experience or because of other reasons, as we mentioned before, it always has an impact not only on his or her social, emotional and cognitive development, but also a severe impact on the whole body, the overall health and an increased risk of developing chronic disease or even earlier deaths. So what we thought was to round off the picture about this topic, we would now like to read you from Dr. Melillo's book, Reconnected Kids, The Symphony of the Brain. So Dr. Melillo wrote, think of the brain as if it was an orchestra with thoughts and action as the notes that change moment to moment to create a musical composition. When the conductor, which is the brain, directs the musician, which are the neurons, to use their instruments, which are the synapse, to create music, which are thought and action, the music begins to play. Sometimes the conductor signals the right side to play louder while it tones down the left side. The key to both sides playing beautiful music together is that each musician must not only play the right notes, but must play them at precisely the right time. This ebb and flow must be perfectly timed. A musician might miss a bit and subsequently the two sides will get out of harmony. We know it is not the instrument which is broken. The musician just need more practice and encouragement. We are trying to find the network on the brain which are malfunctioning and we are stimulating them so they get back in rhythm with the rest of the brain. If we got your curiosity and you want to go deeper into this subject, we have put together a few links for you. But for now, I think we have strained our brains enough. And um, I would like to invite the audience to join us for a relaxation session with a short meditation to steer into the direction of a balanced lifestyle right away. This will take um, in total about 10 minutes. So, are you ready? Shall we begin? Thank you, Dr. Elizabeth, and thank you, Dr. Viaget. Yes, we are ready, and we would love to have a heartfulness relaxation and meditation session today. If one of you would lead it, that would be wonderful and amazing. Begit, will you do it? Yeah, I'd love to do it. So please find a comfortable position and close your eyes. Take a few relaxed breaths. And bring your attention to your feet. Now, imagine that the healing energy from Mother Earth is entering your feet and helping you to relax your whole body. Feel how your toes are relaxing. your feet, your ankles, and now allow 
the energy to move further up your lower legs relaxing all the muscles in your lower legs your knees are relaxing the energy is moving further up relaxing your thighs and your hips and now allow the energy to move up your back feel how all the muscles on your back are relaxing and the energy is moving in front relaxing your stomach area and your chest area And your shoulders are relaxing too. They might drop down, become soft and relaxed as if they are melting away. Now let the energy flow into your arms relaxing the muscles of your upper arms and your elbows underarms wrists hands, fingers, up to your fingertips, bring your attention now to your neck, And all the muscles in your neck are relaxing now. Let the energy now flow to the top of your head. Relaxing your whole head. All your facial muscles the muscles around your mouth around your nose around your ears and on your forehead Your whole body is deeply relaxed now. You might also scan your body now and see 
If there's an area which still needs your attention, and you can relax that area. And in this deep relaxation, gently bring your awareness your heart feel the love and light in your heart present and then imagine that the source of the light and the love is attracting your attention deep within you are getting deeply absorbed in your heart stay there with your attention stay there with your attention
feel feel for one or two more minutes in which closed eyes and try to see what the condition you have acquired Try to see what the condition you have prepared. Let it spread through your whole system. Let it spread through your whole system. And when you are ready, you may slowly open your eyes and bring this condition with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Biagadio. It was a very peaceful meditation session. And I'm grateful for the session. For those of you among the audience, among the participants who are experiencing a heartfulness session for the first time today, I recommend that you log in to www.heartfulness.org and use the resources given there and continue your heartfulness practice. Towards the end of this webinar, we will be sharing a few free resources like the like how to download the Hearts app, the various webinars, the GLOW series and the Pearl series, the free magazine, e-magazine, which is the Heartfulness magazine, links for the master classes, and the YouTube course by Daji. I request that all of you avail all the resources which will be displayed towards the end of this webinar. If you have any queries about this webinar, Neurobehavioral Disorders from a Neurodevelopmental Perspective, I request that you write to us at glow at heartfulness.org. It is displayed here, G-L-O-W at heartfulness.org. Dr. Birgit or Dr. Elizabeth would reply to all of your questions. Thank you so much for joining us today and uh, we look forward to see you in the next webinar in December. It was Thank a pleasure you. to be with you today. <laughs> Same here. And I'm sure the participants have been have immensely benefited with all that you have shared with us. This understanding will allow us to look at this issue in a different way. Thank you That's so much. That's the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> December 10th is the United Nations Human Rights Day. So we have a webinar about that in December. We have with us Ms. Amanda in Roche, who is a United Nations human rights lawyer, and she's a yoga meditation teacher. She's going to speak about her experiences in her life, which made her to pursue the path of peace building and conflict resolution. Currently, she's serving in Central Africa, and we are going to learn more about the United Nations Human Rights Day and so many aspects about it with our conversation with Amanda in Roche. If you have any queries which you would like to ask her, please write to me at glow at heartfulness.org and I'm sure to take up your questions with her. Thank you so much once again for joining us today and uh, have a blessed day.